I'm going to speak from the perspective of social sciences and epidemiology, um, the disciplines um, and multidisciplines from which I come, and also from a U.S. perspective primarily. Uh, Sarah Tishkoff uh, especially will be focusing on a lot of international and global issues. I'm going to briefly give a definition and scope of health disparities, um, talk about health disparities uh, across race and ethnic groups, um, the notion of social determinants, a little bit about what we know about interventions that work to reduce health disparities, and conclude with a few comments about science policy and funding and how they all uh, tie into the health disparities issue. So, so first, a, a little bit of definition. Often the term health equity is used, or health inequities, um, instead of disparities, and, and people like that. It sounds a little more balanced, but, but we often think of them as, um, as the same meaning. So health disparities are the disproportionate disease, disease burden or burden of health behaviors across subpopulations. And most people think about this primarily in terms of differences across racial and ethnic groups um, or across groups of varying socioeconomic status. So that's a lot of where our conversation will go just based on a time limitation. But there are also a lot of other health disparities to think about. Some may be interests of, of yours, uh, across gender groups, groups of varying levels of education, sexual orientation, geography, urban, rural, and so on. Uh, health disparities go beyond just the burden of disease or the differences in behaviors to include access to and quality of healthcare services, an increasingly important uh, focus. And one of the underlying assumptions is that inequality disparities are unfair, unjust, or avoidable, and that that's what we should be working to change. So I'm going to give you just some brief examples of key racial and ethnic disparities in health. For those of you that like your statistics, you won't really need any statistical test to see how big these differences are. They are ginormous, <laughs> simply put. Um, this graph is uh, differences in infant mortality in the United States by racial and ethnic groups. And you can see that the rates are by far the highest for African Americans, followed by American Indians, Hispanics, and then Asians and, and whites. Um, the difference in motor vehicle accidents, actually the highest rates in motor vehicle accidents occur for American Indians that are at about twice the rate um, that they are for whites. Um, heart disease is uh, much higher among African Americans than it is among whites. Um, and homicide, a staggering, almost tenfold um, higher rate among African Americans than among whites. And last, HIV infection. Also, uh, for those of you not working in this area, may be surprised to learn that in the US, there's about a ninefold uh, rate of HIV infection among African Americans compared to whites. So those are just some examples. In the cancer area, um, this is a really good place where we can see uh, the differences between getting a disease, between the incidence of the disease, and death from the disease. So the, the differences there often reflect something about the health care that people are getting, but also perhaps about the aggressiveness of the disease. So for men, African American men have by far the highest rates of um, being diagnosed with cancer, but also of dying from cancer. Um, among women, African Americans have the highest rates of being diagnosed, but it's actually white women who have the highest rates of dying from cancer. And um, you can see those rates differ quite a bit with very high rates for Hispanics as well. Uh, there are other diseases where the racial and ethnic groups that have the excess burden um, are different from, from what you might be thinking of, and one in particular is tuberculosis. We've done a lot to reduce the rates of tuberculosis, as you can see by the, the decrease um, on this graph, but it's actually Asian and Pacific Islanders who have by far the highest rates of tuberculosis, and even though their rates are declining, as the rates of other ethnic groups are, there's still an enormous gap. So the question is why? Why do these differences exist? What can we do about it? And there are a lot of different models and perspectives. This particularly lends itself to this multidisciplinary way of looking at things. 
There are genetic, genomic models. You'll hear from Sarah Tishkoff a uh, great deal about that. Um, issues related to racism, sexism, discrimination that I know Dorothy Roberts will be addressing. Um, social environmental models and models related to access to health care um, that I'm going to talk more specifically about. And their interaction models um, that are the combinations of a lot of these factors. So let's take a look at the question of social class and health disparities. Um, social class differences in morbidity and mortality are largely due to differences in the material conditions in people's lives, the places that people live, work, um, play, uh, and differences in their access to resources, both private resources and public resources. Um, the day-to-day -day education, work, health care, recreation, and so on. Uh, there's an interesting theory called the broken windows theory. This is actually a theory that emerged out of uh, the field of criminology, which is a specialty, kind of some people would say an offshoot of sociology. Um, and it was introduced about 35 years ago by Wilson and Kelling. And it was a theory that when you kind of drive down the street and you see broken windows, they indicate neighborhood disorder. And it's been found over and over again that higher rates of crime are associated with broken windows. And this theory has been adopted by um, some people in the health field. A really interesting study by Deborah Cohn and others in New Orleans found that rates of gonorrhea in micro neighborhoods in New Orleans were associated with the prevalence of this broken windows index. And more recently, Howard Frumpkin has suggested that the looking at health and the built environment, um, broken windows is a good analogy and a place to start showing us that, that neighborhoods can be conducive to or um, not conducive to health improvement. So when we talk about social determinants, we're talking about the conditions that people live in that are not necessarily medical or health or biology, um, and education is a, is a prime one. Um, and some people might not like that this um, graph, I know my math colleagues don't like that this graph starts at 40, but the bottom line here is that college graduates can expect to live at least five years longer than individuals who haven't graduated from high school. So that's good news for all of us, I think, in this room. Um, and that this gradient of longevity and education uh, exists for men and women, although women tend to live a little bit longer. And th this is not how long you expect to live, not to four, 54 and 48. That's after the age of 25. <laughs> so just in case anybody's like thinking that that, that doesn't sound old enough. So health behaviors often track along with educational level as well, and there are higher rates of smoking among people with lower education. Um, only 9% of college, grad, college graduates smoke in the current environment, and about 29% of those with only a high school education or less. And that difference has widened over time. So something going on there, some association with education, not necessarily causal, but definitely a correlate. Um, we also see that smoking rates are highest in low-income neighborhoods. So I'm going to show you some um, Philadelphia maps, thanks to the health department putting these all together. They come from local surveys of our region and from the American Community Survey done by the census. And this shows adult smoking prevalence on the left with the highest rates in red, and this shows the percentage of people living in poverty in these neighborhoods, and don't they look similar? Something going on. So why might that be? Interesting, um, the next map shows the uh, density of tobacco retailers um, in neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And doesn't that look similar, too, um, that the highest rates of tobacco retailers align with the highest rates of smoking and the highest rates of poverty? I, I won't comment further on that, but we can talk more about it later. Um, when we look at obesity, we actually see uh, a pattern that has a lot of similarities. Um, this uh, first graph is uh, from studies and surveys done in New York showing that there's a fourfold uh, rate of obesity among adults living in East Harlem compared to those living on the Upper East Side. So it's not geographic. Something else must be going on. And in Philadelphia, we have childhood obesity and adult obesity distributions in the city. And we have those juxtaposed with education, with red being the lowest education. So again, we see social determinants 
really in our face. Um, so what's going on? Here's one thing that happens to be going on that we found in our research that there are, uh, is less availability of fruits and vegetables in lower income neighborhoods than in higher income neighborhoods. That could be something contributing. And just to circle back and remind you, we have higher rates of poverty among blacks, American Indians, and Hispanics um, by far than among white uh, majority populations. We also have disparities in healthcare access. Um, basically, you see here that the risk of being uninsured is much lower for whites than it is for non-whites, and the risk of having a difficulty communicating with your healthcare provider is also higher for non-whites than it is for whites. And that, that also can include um, language differences um, embedded within that. Um, an interesting study that Karen Rhodes and others published a few years back looked at primary care access, and this was before the Affordable Care Act. They phoned about 13,000, uh, made about 13,000 phone calls across 10 states asking to make an appointment with a primary care provider. And what they found was that 84% of privately insured people who said they were privately insured on the phone were able to get an appointment, but only 58% of those on Medicaid. So it's not just the insurance, it might be the type of insurance that one has also. Um, and maybe a little discrimination going on there. So what can we do to reduce health disparities? What are some ways to think about that? I want to suggest that some of the most important ways to reduce health disparities are by going upstream. What do we mean by going upstream? Well, if you can think of this raging river, and you can think of somebody playing alongside of it, they might be falling in the river upstream. We can fish them out downstream, and they will survive. But wouldn't it be better if we could prevent them from falling in to the stream in the first place? So upstream health improvement strategies address health problems by addressing these social determinants and the environment and the policies that shape our health and our health behavior. Um, they have the greatest potential to improve health among disadvantaged groups and potentially can provide the greatest benefit overall to the most people. So what are some of those strategies? This, this model that's been um, adopted over the last couple decades very strongly starts with dealing with individuals and goes all the way up to the social and economic policies neighborhoods and communities. And so we, we need all those. It's not to say we don't need to help individuals or, or work with individuals to improve the situation, but we really need to work at all these levels. And this um, health impact pyramid that was put forward by Tom Frieden, the previous director of the Centers for Disease Control, pretty much nails the idea that um, you can put a lot of effort into things like counseling and clinical interventions, but you can make more of a population impact by working toward the bottom of this, this uh, pyramid, changing the context, changing socioeconomic factors. Um, when I first heard some of these ideas earlier in my career, one of the first things that struck me is, but I'm trained in health. And you can, can think doctors can say this. I wasn't trained to change socioeconomic factors. So we really need to think creatively about how we can all be involved in trying to solve these problems. A couple of the strategies to reduce health disparities that are promising are quite simply reducing resource inequality and disparities in education and income. Things that are very timely in our current political climate and uh, we've made some progress and um, lots more to come. Addressing the environments and context, such as built environment improvements, uh, ensuring that interventions have adequate reach, such as the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, very much on the political agenda right now, uh, medical homes. And we can also, as scientists, make sure that we pay attention to these issues and um, make extra efforts to include disadvantaged groups in our studies, um, and that our research also has that secondary impact of improving health outcomes. Um, some interesting work that's been done in Philadelphia by Charlie Branis and colleagues um, takes aim at uh, the built environment and housing, very specifically abandoned building remediation. Um, they worked with the Philadelphia Housing Authority that um, enacted a Philadelphia Doors and Windows Ordinance in 2011. Um, and 
did a comparison study where they renovated vacant and abandoned buildings and compared them to non-remediated buildings. And you could see some of the before and after there. And they actually found reduction in violent crime, gun assaults, and nuisance crimes. So their particular focus on the injury and violence side of the health equation, but there are other health impacts as well. And they're currently doing a larger trial of uh, vacant lot remediation. So what works? So these are a couple, of, these are examples, these are ideas. Uh, the Community Guide to Preventive Services, which I served on for 10 years, looks at the literature overall. What does the research tell us? It tells us that education programs and policies do help to promote health equity, early childhood education, full day kindergarten, high school completion programs, and school-based health centers. Housing programs, tenant-based rental assistance programs have been found to impact health equity. And that there is insufficient evidence for some of these strategies of trying to improve culturally competent health care, bilingual services, diverse health care workforce. That doesn't mean that these aren't effective. It just means that there aren't enough studies yet that have shown that they're effective, or maybe we need to look for improved ways to, to make them work. Last, I want to just say a few things about science policy and funding and some uh, developments over the last two decades that affect those of us who do research with human subjects, um, and particularly those of us that get government funding. Um, in 1997, the Office of Management and Budget, an important health institution, not, uh, <laughs> revised the standards for collecting and reporting on race and ethnicity. And in 2001, the National Institutes of Health adopted these standards and required everyone involved with any funding, intramural or extramural, um, to follow them. And in 2000, the National Institute for uh, Minority Health and Health Disparities was first created and given full institute status in 2010. Um, what did that lead to? It led to this required race and ethnicity reporting that we all have to adhere to. We can come back and talk about this later because you'll see that it, it puts the big bubble around um, Hispanic and non-Hispanic and underneath that um, different racial identifications. The ideal strategies for improving health equity are um, not just to reduce the difference between the disadvantage and the advantage, but to, if you will, uh, take the the idea of a rising tide lifting all boats to create social and physical environments that pr promote good health for all and um, achieve, uh, eliminate disparities for the health of all groups. A lot of unanswered questions remain. We don't know what combinations of strategies work best. We don't know how long it takes for meaningful change, but we see that it probably takes longer than one grant funding cycle. Um, <laughs> And um, the question that my colleagues, Sarah and Dorothy, will be addressing, where do genetic, biological, historical, and legal <coughs> issues um, fit into this equation? Thank you.